was beginning at this time in the 16 and 1700s that universities spread beyond Europe, right, and successfully transplanted this model to new parts of the world. And this started first with Latin America. And I don't know as much about universities in Latin America. Maybe I'll talk about that more another time. But suffice it to say that several universities were founded in the Spanish colonies in the 1500s, beginning first with Santo Domingo in the West Indies, and then others in the late 1500s in South America, in what's now uh, Colombia and other countries. Okay. These universities were mainly aimed at training clergy and missionaries, right, in order to extend the Christianization of the Americas and the Christianization of the indigenous people. Now, little by little, over time, through the 16 and 1700s, these universities diversified and took on the sort of greater range of subjects and disciplines that you saw in Europe, you know, such as Renaissance humanism. And then post-independence in the 19th century, new uh, secular national universities were also founded in most of these new uh, republics in Latin America. And these universities really took to heart the medieval ideal of independence from political authority. Okay, so, uh, so the universities in Latin America really have fiercely guarded their, their political separation from the state, uh, their academic freedom, and they've often served as hotbeds of political dissent, okay, and a lot of uh, reform movements, revolutionary movements in Latin America have started from the scholars and the students at the universities, much more so than in the United States. You can see some similar patterns in Europe, too, in some places, in Germany, in Italy, uh, in France, but I would still say not as much so probably as Latin America, right? So, so the universities have taken on a kind of special distinct role in the Latin American nations. But it's really in the United States that the university has become the most deeply woven, the most deeply entrenched in the kind of basic fabric of society, okay? Uh, so, so ironically, although it's, there, there is, there's no Middle Ages in America, right? Before, before 1500, North America was uh, a continent of indigenous Americans with uh, you know, little or no contact with Europe, although there might have been some, you know, <laughs> become a patron to find out. But strangely enough, ironically enough, this very medieval European institutional form has really kind of reached its apotheosis, I think you'd have to say, in the U.S., so American universities began initially as small colonial colleges, and they were usually called colleges, maybe just the college or the college of this or that colony, aimed, again, like in Latin America, aimed at primarily at training clergy, okay, clergymen for their own church, whether that was Congregationalist or Baptist in New England or Anglican in New York or the South, creating a clergy fully formed and educated in the liberal arts who could serve as leaders of these colonial societies and also ideally further the mission of converting the Indians. Okay. And all of these colonial colleges that especially the earliest ones from the 1600s often had Indian students, you know, converted Christian Indian students because this sort of, uh, fit with and supported their idealized self-image as kind of missionary seminaries aimed at Christianizing this new continent. And they sometimes were called seminaries. This continues right up through the 1700s. People who graduated from the colonial colleges were sometimes referred to as having a attended seminary, right? But in fact, they weren't like seminaries in the old world. Right? They, they did teach the liberal arts on the medieval model. 18 colonial colleges were founded in the North American colonies before 1776. The first, you might know, was Harvard in the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1636. So, you know, only six years after the Puritan migration created the Massachusetts Bay Colony, they already had uh, a small college started up. 
Then later, uh, in 1692, the College of William and Mary in Virginia, right? So Harvard in Massachusetts is Congregationalist. William and Mary in Virginia is Anglican. And then shortly after it, St. John's uh, in Maryland. And then Yale, another Congregationalist college in Connecticut in 1701. And then various others, a, a, a Moravian college in Pennsylvania. Another Anglican college called King's College is founded in New York. That one uh, is what later becomes Columbia. The College of Rhode Island is founded in Providence, well, first in Warren, and then moves to Providence uh, in the 1760s. And that one is interreligious, but it's mainly sponsored and supported by Baptists, right? So in order to train a qualified, educated Baptist clergy, these colleges were really crucial because it was very hard for colonials to travel all the way back to Europe, right? And take the dangerous, long, expensive voyage back to Europe in order to enroll in a university, so it made more sense to form a college locally within a colony where students wouldn't have to travel as far and where they could be housed and fed and be supervised, right? So, so these mostly teenage colonial students would be under heavy supervision, right? They would have uh, faculty watching them practically day and night, watching what they eat and drink, uh, what they read. Uh, often they were prohibited from engaging in games. If you think of the earliest congregational colleges like Harvard and Yale, they, they were founded by the people we call Puritans, right? So this was, <laughs> this was not a freewheeling society to begin with, right? So we see the colleges take up a mission of moral instruction, right? Not only of, uh, of passing down knowledge in important disciplines or in philosophy, but also in forming what they saw as virtuous men who exercised self-control, and who could be trusted to run these often very precarious colonial outposts in America, right? So there was extreme discipline and supervision. And in this way, they were not at all like the student-run universities of the Middle Ages, right? In, in a sense, we're seeing a kind of opposite mirror image of Bologna, right? Where the students decided to form the university and to run it according to their needs. Instead, now we have the adults in these societies deciding they want a college and putting their elite boys into it and using them as instruments of social control and formation. Again, they were mostly teenagers uh, and there was more frequent graduation from these colleges, right? It became more and more normal for a man who was enrolled and who went through the time and the work and the sacrifice of studying at one of these colleges because it was, you know, not very fun. It was more normal for them to go through the whole process and walk away with a degree that they could use to get uh, a clergy position or a teaching position or a government position, okay? Not surprisingly, there were fairly frequent rebellions, especially in the tumultuous uh, 18th century, right? Between this, the 1760s and the 1790s, there were repeated waves of student rebellions. Uh, you know, at Harvard, there was the famous bread and butter rebellion, which was sparked by um, the bad quality of the food. There was the conic sections rebellion sparked by methods of teaching geometry, okay? And especially after about 1768, it became a somewhat common occurrence for rebelling students to erect and march around a liberty tree, okay? So you see a sort of mimicry in the same way that the colonies were calling on these ideals of liberty and rebelling against the parliament. So students would sometimes rebel against their own teachers, in the college. And when this happened, you know, sometimes accommodations were made, sometimes the rebelling students were all simply expelled. Okay, and this, again, you know, like the splitting off of universities in Europe, this could sometimes help boost the newer, smaller colleges being formed at the time. If, you know, a bunch of Harvard students get expelled, maybe they'll just go down to the College of Rhode Island. Things like this happened. 
So little by little, these student rebellions did weaken the kind of strict discipline and allow for a little more freedom and socialization and a little more updating, modernization of the curriculum. But they remained religiously affiliated, right? And most of the old and prestigious colleges in the U.S. continued to have a religious affiliation into the 19th century. And all the way through on up even to the early 1900s, the colleges continued to present themselves as havens for moral instruction. Moral philosophy uh, was considered the highest discipline, often taught by the college or university president. Right? And it was complemented, of course, by frequent required worship at chapel. Okay, So the overarching purpose, you could say, was creating persons of moral virtue, as these societies understood it, that would then compose a virtuous leadership class. Okay, And this was true both of the colonies before the revolution and of the new republic. Okay. Now, in this environment, sort of after the waves of student rebellions in the 1700s diminished, uh, students found other ways of kind of accommodating themselves and carving out some sort of sphere of freedom for, you know, fun and socialization. And this included the emergence of fraternities and all kinds of literary societies and debating societies. Okay, so, so that, you know, having a debate about literature or philosophy, you know, sounds awfully dweeby, maybe, by today's standards, but uh, it was considered something fun, uh, something students could do on their own outside of the strictures of discipline and outside the gaze of the faculty. And this is how a lot of student clubs started, uh, you know, beginning first with Phi Beta Kappa in 1776, which then later kind of became more of just an academic honor society. But then many others, including Greek letter fraternities in the 1820s and 30s. Okay. Some of these societies then also started to adopt transcendentalist sorts of uh, philosophy, emphasizing nature, uh, the attainment of an authentic selfhood, personal independence, free thought, okay, in, uh, in harmony with nature. Right? They become countercultural. They emphasize poetry, uh, emotion, self-development, right? So in a lot of ways, this, this new movement in the American colleges in the 19th century, this kind of romantic transcendentalist movement, really mimicked Renaissance humanism, right? And the search for sort of new inspirations for self-development. Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, was already growing in fame as a kind of new, rebellious, free-thinking philosopher in the 1830s when he was finally allowed to give a speech at Harvard in 1836 called The American Scholar, in which he said that poetry should be the North Star of American education. Okay, so, so poetry should sort of lead the way. Again, you can see, maybe consciously, maybe not, how these new thinkers mimicked and echoed the humanists of the 1400s. And little by little, they were able to make inroads and find a place for the study of secular literature and history and drama and so on in the colleges, which came to be grouped under the title humanities, right? And, you know, humanities, basically just like uh, humanitas or studia humanitatis of the humanists, right? So these student associations and societies that had, you know, maybe gained a foothold for this kind of counterculture in the colleges, as the colleges adapted, they became more and more co-opted into the fabric of the colleges, right? They were put in particular buildings on the campus of the college. Uh, they were given faculty advisors and supervision, and they were integrated into the institution, which more and more provided a kind of complete immersive social experience, right? You'd have your friends, you might meet your marriage partners, your business partners, uh, all in this sort of complete world where you study, play, debate, form relationships, right? 
And by the mid-19th century, it seems we can say that the colleges and also the early universities, right? So as colleges added on faculties of medicine or law, they could be called universities, right? More and more, these colleges and universities provided a social belonging, right? An identity, okay? You might feel and develop an emotional loyalty, symbols, songs you associate with your college or university. And as one friend of mine, a listener, pointed out, they kind of provided almost like a lineage, okay? Uh, A sort of continuing, enduring, tradition-bound social group that you could belong to and have pride in, almost like belonging to an aristocratic house in Europe, right? And this was especially important, the creation of these kinds of networks in a generally egalitarian society, right? The United States is more individualistic, there's more, was, (laughs) more social mobility, right? Uh, Different social groups and classes intermix. Uh, So in a way, the colleges and universities kind of fulfilled a need, right? not only for class formation, not only for the the cultivation of a kind of elite governing class, but also of of special sort of bonds of loyalty and belonging, okay? People could say, you know, I'm a Harvard man like him, or, you know, I'm a Princeton man, or uh, or with their fraternity, you know, they could say, I'm an alpha delt, and have this sort of sentimental connection to people who went to some other college or university far away. Right. So this uh, provided, you might say, a certain kind of new structure for society. Right. And later in the 1800s, especially after the Civil War, they also the colleges took up a mission of cultivating a new kind of masculinity. Right. So in an industrial society where very few people are farmers and, you know, there's this growing class of educated people who don't do manual work, there was some anxiety that college educated men were sort of effeminate. Right. They weren't they didn't have uh, the the masculine strength or courage that the national leaders of a strong republic should have. And so the colleges and universities took up sports, most particularly football, right? Football is sort of an artificial creation adapted from rugby that was used as a kind of instrument to masculinize American college and university students. And the Ivy League, this sort of grouping of eight usually, you know, mostly old prestigious universities in the Northeast, uh, It didn't originally have any sort of criterion about the prestige of the college. It was a football league, right? These were these were the sort of old, you know, tradition bound blue blood institutions that were all afraid that, you know, they had to toughen up their boys. And so they created a football league. And that's why we have the Ivy League. So by the end of the 19th century, people from abroad who observed American colleges and universities noted their public spiritedness, right? Their effort and their emphasis on training men for business and government and military and science and all of these practical utilitarian pursuits that they believed would help strengthen the country, lift up the standard of living of the country, right? There was this sort of new secular, practical mission towards, you might say, the the national common good, right? There also was very high mobilization in war, right? Considering that students, college students, were usually from the upper or, or middle classes of their society, very large proportions of them volunteered to fight in war. We saw this in, in the Civil War, and then again in the First and Second World Wars, right? So the colleges and universities were more and more seen as as practical and utilitarian, modern, and also increasingly as a vehicle for change and social mobility, right? Uh, So at the same time, at the end of the 19th century, states started creating state-supported land-grant universities, 
Okay, now this was something different and unusual, right? Because the tradition of a college or university was to have independence, right, from the state, okay, even if they might be chartered by a, a king or an emperor. Well, in this case, you now had Republican governments, elected Republican states, creating universities that would receive their revenue and their basic instructions on what to teach and how from the state, right? And that was a new idea, but it was in keeping with this new kind of utilitarian practical uh, model of an American college. There also was the early creation of women's colleges, right? So there had always been schools where women were taught by tutors and teachers, or, uh, or, or I should say, since the beginning of the 19th century, there were Quaker schools and so on that taught girls. Uh, but now you started to see the creation of women's colleges, some of which were independent, uh, standing on their own like Smith, or that were sister schools, kind of affiliated with the existing uh, men's colleges, such as uh, Pembroke, alongside Brown, Radcliffe, together with Harvard, uh, Barnard by Columbia in New York, and so on. And also, in addition, a more rare occurrence was also the creation of co-ed schools with men and women taught together, such as Oberlin in Ohio. Now, while these universities were going through this sort of series of transformations, in the United States, some of their brothers and sisters back in Europe were increasingly seen as lagging behind the times, right, for all the reasons I talked about before. And the innovators who led the way in sort of bringing in practical science, human uh, social science into the universities uh, were German, okay? And the Germans pioneered the first research universities, okay? So a research university works and uh, has very different goals from the traditional medieval or renaissance university. Uh, the object is not to pass down a received set of authoritative knowledge, uh, nor is it moral formation or character formation like uh, the Renaissance humanists or the American colleges. Rather, it's the creation of new knowledge, right? It's directing resources to recruiting exceptionally smart, innovative people to go out and experiment or explore and create new bodies of knowledge, okay? And, uh, you know, some historians like William Clark have used the phrase dynamic equilibrium, to describe how a research university should operate, right? It should sort of take creative, maybe unconventional people, maybe unorthodox thinkers, and give them a nice university position where they can sort of safely produce papers and books that then can be taught to students and integrated into existing thought and education, right? A dynamic equilibrium. Certain colleges and universities in German really celebrated genius, originality, and even eccentricity, right? So this is where the image of the professor, not as sort of a stodgy uh, old doctor, but rather as a sort of, you know, quirky, eccentric, living the life of the mind, you know, sort of disheveled, but coming up with brilliant ideas in his study or his lab. This is where that notion of the academic comes from, from these early research universities in Germany, right? And the goal of a research university, you know, as I said, it's, it's, there's a kind of social control, right? Keeping a dynamic equilibrium and also creating new scientific knowledge that can be used to control and rationalize society, right? It, it, it's the, the, the spearhead of reordering society to be more rational, more productive, better managed, right? And the scholars at these research universities are not simply expected to teach, but there's also immense expectation to research and publish, right? So publication kind of becomes the, the lifeblood, okay, keeping the universities going. 
The research universities also create multiple specialized grad schools, and there's a much greater emphasis on the PhD, right? It's, it's a complete education is seen as finishing with a PhD, and the PhD doesn't simply empower you to teach in a medical school or a law school. It shows that you are an expert in some very specialized field, often scientific. The model of the research university spread to the United States in the late 1800s, beginning first with the creation of Johns Hopkins at Baltimore in 1876 as an explicitly scientific, research-focused institution. Then by U of Chicago in 1890, right, another dynamic, fast-growing industrial city, city of migrants and immigrants, right? These universities, Johns Hopkins and U of Chicago, promote an extreme work ethic, which arguably they still do, right? Extreme specialization, right? And sort of constant preparation for the, the PhD, for PhD programs. The philosophical ideal of the research university, even beyond the scientific disciplines, more and more is objectivity. And if you go back to the humanities, like history and literature and philosophy, more and more the ideal of kind of objective scientific truth is emphasized, right? And this means, as part of objectivity, is separation or even abandonment of inherited norms and prejudices, right? So whereas a colonial college maybe was aimed at ensuring that everybody who graduated fit a certain moral model, the research university is, again, kind of the revolutionary opposite, right? Putting aside uh, these, these inherited norms, experimenting, finding some sort of new objective model, right? So gradually after about 1900, again, older prestigious universities start to adopt these ideals, Right? So it's pioneered by the new colleges like Johns Hopkins in Chicago. But then after 1900, it's taken up particularly by Harvard. Right? And this is part of how Harvard maintains its position kind of at the forefront of intellectual life is by changing into a research university. And then others, right? other Ivy League colleges, state universities, and so on. And particularly influential in this transition, I would argue, is the the very famous author Henry Adams, who was really popular and impactful, unlike any other author in the early 1900s, right? So he was from the old blue blood Adams family of New England, but he went and studied law at Berlin in Germany. And after coming back to the United States, he, he advocated modernizing education. And he wrote a memoir called The Education of Henry Adams, in which he he sort of took a step back and examined how, how obsolete uh, his education had been and how little it had prepared him for the rapid change, right? Uh, the, the mass media, the electrification, political conflict, the war of the 20th century. And this message from Henry Adams hit home, particularly after World War I, right, which devastated the old blue blood elite, right, killed a lot of its members. And also sort of drove home this message that the old civilization rooted in the colonial age or in Europe in the medieval age even was kind of destroying itself from within and that some sort of new philosophy, new science was needed to grapple with this rapidly changing new world. So there's great disillusionment and sort of urgency for change after World War I. This is uh, reflected in a particular unusual way also at Columbia. So at, at Columbia University, Franz Boas and a group of cultural relativists, right, who, who are technically anthropologists, right, so they come from that sort of science of man, advocate for cultural relativism, the idea that norms, morals are all uh, inter interchangeable in a sense. They're all on an equal footing, right? It's all just relative to what society you belong to, right? And in a way, this becomes kind of the new orthodoxy, you could say, of academics from the 20s uh, onward. These universities also become increasingly internationalized, 
right? They're scientific, they're promoting business, industry, politics. They are more and more separated from the particular customs of the town or city where they're located, and they become very international. They're now attracting people, students and scholars from Europe, from Asia, from Latin America, right? So once again, they're, you could say, cosmopolitan and distinct from their local locations in a way that the early universities were back in the 12 and 1300s. But this also leads to something of a backlash, right? There's um, an effort in the 1910s and 20s to go back and again teach a canon, to go back and teach a set curriculum of, of the classics, okay? And this is actually where the term canon starts to be widely used, right? The notion that there's this sort of received body of wisdom that students should all learn separate from the new science and the social science, right? So the universities, this, this research university model, it starts to get some pushback pretty early on, and then it's really challenged and starts to break down after World War II. So for one thing, there's a tremendous loss of men. A lot of American men mobilize and a lot are killed in the war, much more than in World War I. A lot of small schools, colleges, seminaries go under, and a lot of fraternities go under from loss of people and money. And then starting in the 60s, there's a new growing counter counterculture, right? A counterculture that is individualist, uh, that is antinomian, right? That rejects norms and even the idea of law, right? Free-spirited. And there's a growing uh, antipathy towards accepted institutions, right? So w which is especially fueled by the disillusionment around the Vietnam War, right? So in a way, the Vietnam War brings on a disillusionment a lot like the First World War. So students start to organize and rebel against the curriculum, right? The idea that there should be core requirements at all. Some colleges like Brown uh, abolish their core curriculum, Wesleyan. There are student walkouts, student takeovers and occupations, such as at Columbia. So the very sources and symbols of authority are under attack. Some of this is directed at the curriculum and at the canon, right? The, the idea that these accepted traditional authors, your Aristotle, Cicero, Augustine, are outdated and are unacceptable, right? Are often racist and sexist, okay? And there are efforts to try to break down the isolation of the university, right? In the 60s and 70s, a lot of people start to refer to the universities as an ivory tower, right? A sort of privileged, isolated uh, clique. There are frequent conflicts of town versus gown, right? The local people and the university fighting over land and real estate, over money, over social status, okay? And more and more academia is viewed, including by academics, academia comes to be viewed as a kind of distinct industry and sphere of society separate from the rest of the world. Concurrent with that, there's also a sexual revolution. Okay, so with birth control, sex becomes more frequent, more tolerated, right? Or at least the, the consequences are reduced. Okay, there is more frequent fraternization of men and women, especially among the young. Now, this has a big impact on the colleges and universities because most of them at this time are still single sex, right? Right through the 1960s, they mostly are still sex segregated. So with the sexual revolution, there's much greater demand among young men for access, time and space to fraternize with women. And a lot of qualified young men from good high schools, wealthy families, want to go to coeducational colleges. And the old guard, like you know Harvard, Yale, Columbia, are losing a lot of applicants. And hence, these top colleges, one by one, change and start to accept women. And in some cases, 
like Brown and Pembroke and Harvard and Radcliffe, the sister colleges are merged in together with the male colleges. In other cases, they just open up to female applicants. Uh, And the reason wasn't because those colleges were, you know, optimistic or enthusiastic about women's advancement or because they wanted the, the talents of these women. It was that they wanted the talents of the men and they were afraid of the men that they were losing because they didn't have women, right? So so the Ivy League and other prestigious colleges gradually go co-ed in the 1970s and 80s, okay? As for this, the women's schools, you know, some of the sister schools merged in, some did not. You know, Barnard still persists as a separate college. And some independent female colleges like Smith remained, while some like Vassar also went co-ed, right? So there's a sort of mirror image process where a lot of the female-only colleges become co-educational. Not surprisingly, there is a flourishing of sex and dating uh, in colleges and universities. It now can happen more quickly, more easily, more freely. There's a lot of uh, pairing, right, forming of long-term relationships and of marriages. It now becomes very common for people to find their marriage partners, not only at the neighboring college of a different sex, but at their own college, maybe even in their own dormitory. Right? And with this, there also comes frequent preying upon young women in colleges and universities, right? They're often naive, inexperienced, are first experimenting with sex, alcohol, drugs, and it seems to allow for an environment, an easy environment for preying upon these young women, right? And often the predators are other male college students. Sometimes they're from outside the college and they come to parties and events on college campuses uh, as, as a kind of easy target. So with all of these changes in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, there's a breakdown an almost complete abandonment of the older principle of in loco parentis, the sort of legalistic idea that the college is responsible for the behavior and well-being of the student in place of the parent, and that they have the authority for sort of moral formation and proper behavior, right? More and more parents and students want to be left alone in a freer environment. And this, ironically, is exacerbated by the prohibition of alcohol, right? So in the 60s, say, it was normal for universities to allow the consumption of alcohol at university events. But when that is banned and the legal drinking age is raised to 21, then alcohol drinking retreats into sort of closed secretive spaces, especially fraternities, right? Fraternity parties kind of become the refuge for drunken debauchery. And in that environment, again, there's less supervision, Right. So so you could say that the sort of uh, disorderly life of the early universities comes back with a vengeance right, in the later 20th century. Now, by 2000 or so, we can see a new model starting to take shape of a new kind of university, which is entrepreneurial, business and science oriented, which is very individualistic, which is allows or even encourages students to choose their own course of study, uh, shape their own social life and routine. The humanities are in place in the curriculum in place of older ideals of moral instruction, religion, moral philosophy, and in place of the canon. Okay, So the humanities studies tend to be based on taste, on what students enjoy on an individual level. And colleges and universities become more and more not only a venue for social mobility, but really a requirement, okay? Especially with deindustrialization, it becomes very hard for non-college graduates to get remunerative jobs, to advance materially or socially. So there's more and more need and demand for university education, And hence, universities and colleges multiply, right? So end of the 20th century, we're seeing many more springing up or growing. There's also massive proliferation of colleges and universities in the UK, 
Okay, so in a, in a country where it used to be the really the preserve of the upper class, you now see far more Britons seeking out college education and a real multiplication of colleges and universities and also a massive increase in Latin America as well, right? So, so as traditional heavy industries and trades leave the, with uh, outsourcing, offshoring, mechanization, the, the demand for college education is swelling. So these new colleges and universities tend to be judged on the one hand based on how well they set you up to get a good paying job, right? So it's economic and also based on fun, right? How fun is the social scene, the student clubs, the sports, okay? All of these things can play a huge role in who a college attracts and whether it succeeds, right? So traditional academic fields, the canon, history, philosophy, become more and more secondary, right? More and more sort of relegated to a kind of niche taste role, okay? So there's another irony that even as colleges and universities multiply and the demand and the desire increases, a new crisis, I think, begins. And we're seeing a new crisis really intensifying. There's a loss of a sense of moral or political purpose. What is a college education supposed to do to your character? Uh, you know, what does it do other than maybe give you some knowledge or skills that help you get a job? A lot of people are very disillusioned or even feel antipathy towards colleges and universities that they see as simply sort of elitist, right? Uh, there's very frequent protest, protest, counter-protest, frequent dispute and fracturing, okay, over political issues. So the object of a university is really unclear and all sorts of dilemmas frequently open up, okay? How do you teach about problematic, or, you know, again, in scare quotes, problematic texts and ideas from the past? Okay, there are frequent attacks and efforts to remove received texts from the canon or to stop the teaching of the canon altogether. There's a, a general lack of shared norms or beliefs, right? You might say that relativism is really trickling down, right? What... Uh, is, is there any sort of value or belief that a university is supposed to represent or perpetuate? Uh, there also has been a slowness, I think it's fair to say, to respond to the frequency of sexual assault and rape. Right? And that's created another massive crisis. Okay? It's often been ignored, brushed under the rug in order to protect the prestige, the reputation of these institutions that have to compete on a market. It's very unclear how common sexual assault and rape are, but uh, it, it is clearly more frequent than the universities want to admit. There's sometimes now talk of a rape culture, okay? And ironically, this is another irony that uh, there's, there's now often alarm around rape culture at the same time that it is often dismissed uh, the notion that universities should teach morality and should teach character, right? And yet, and yet there's this complaint about a sort of culture of rape and assault, okay? There also is increasingly extreme specialization, right? And in increasingly arcane jargons developed for niche fields, niche journals and departments. And this feeds into a larger loss of respect and prestige in the eyes of the public, right? And there's increasing mockery of academics, okay, for indulging in kind of uh, obscure or useless and impractical speculation, right? Rather like the humanists mocked the scholastics back in the 1400s. Okay, and... Uh, even more frequently, or I should say even more recently, uh, you know, within the last few years, there's been criticism of sort of uh, universities as fitting into a kind of aloof cosmopolitan elite of the coastal cities, right, that is out of touch with ordinary people. And certainly a college education is clearly a, a, a major marker of belonging to one or another social and political camp. 
in American society and also to some degree in other countries, you know, like Britain, which is very similar to the United States in a lot of ways. There is cutting of funding, right? Governments, especially state and local governments, are increasingly cutting off uh, money to, uh, to state universities, community colleges, Okay, whole departments are vanishing, especially humanities departments, language departments that used to be kind of anchors of humanistic liberal education. And that you might see as kind of the last vestiges of the university as moral instruction, right? Those are sort of vanishing day to day. Some institutions like Harvard have responded by reorganizing how they finance themselves. Okay, there's a Harvard system where each department gets money based on how much money it brings in. And that actually can work, it might be surprising, it can work very well for humanities departments because humanities departments are pretty inexpensive to run. And they often teach large lecture classes to a lot of students that are bringing in a lot of tuition. So this has worked well for some institutions to balance how they distribute funds to different departments. But other institutions, especially the boards, the donors, to institutions that might come from business backgrounds, sometimes actually fight this and redirect money away from humanities into, into the more technical disciplines like medical schools that are more expensive. The universities are increasingly run by a swelling administrative class that in some cases encourages these changes, right? The closing or cutting of humanities departments, okay? So now there are, uh, in some institutions, we can see as much as a third of the staff is administrators, deans, assistant deans, assistant provosts uh, that aren't directly involved in teaching and instead are more about fundraising, managing money, who often, in order to justify their jobs, create all kinds of bureaucratic processes, paperwork, committees of committees, okay? Faculty sometimes complain about this sort of endless proliferation of administrators, and some of them suck up quite a bit of money. Uh, there are some university presidents, like, for example, the president of Ohio State, who hop around from one university to another, seeking out the highest pay that they can get. Meanwhile, the faculty are increasingly casualized, right? Uh, more and more uh, tenured professorships are eliminated and instead temporary adjuncts are hired semester by semester or year by year, okay? Uh, who often have, you know, little pay or job security and it creates more disruption and lack of continuity for students. I even experienced this at the fairly elite university I went to that several of my favorite professors simply disappeared when the class was over because they were adjuncts. Okay, so we see a change from a sort of long-standing, tradition-bound institution to an increasingly unstable institution with frequent turnover that has to compete on a very volatile market. And this is aside from the for-profit universities and colleges, which also have sprung up in recent years and which often spring up and fold fairly quickly, right? So the whole educational scene is becoming more volatile and more money-driven, okay? And in this environment, especially with the casualization of professorships, there's loss of talent now to other fields like publishing, and if you go through higher, you know, advanced degree education, like a PhD program, more and more these programs have to prepare and direct graduates to seek out employment in business or government or publishing or entertainment because the new jobs are simply not replacing the old positions in the old uh, departments that disappear. Right? So, so there's a, a sort of brain drain, a loss of talent, at the same time that there's this increasing loss of prestige and increasing indifference or even antipathy towards academia. Now, it's interesting to note that the hiring of adjuncts on temporary contracts is actually very similar to the first university at Bologna, where professors would be hired on temporary contracts and paid or rehired based on their performance. 
So you might say this is not uh, so much of an aberration, but the important difference to note is that in the medieval university at Bologna, it was the students receiving the instruction who decided whom to hire and whom to fire and on what terms, right? Now, the students have little or no control, uh, practically no input <laughs> into anything, into university policy, uh, into hiring, admission, certainly not the allocation of money. Instead, it's, uh, it's not even faculty. Even faculty have diminishing power. It's this administrative class that sort of runs the institution from afar. So it's this strange layering of the legacy of an old medieval style institution with sort of bureaucracy, modern bureaucratic society, and the modern market, right? So the present day university, you might say, you know, with, with its adjunct faculty, with its large administrative costs, with its competition for, for athletes and star performers, it's sort of the apotheosis of the business-like, market-driven, bureaucratic, data-driven corporation, right? They're more and more, you could say, resembling modern corporations rather than the sort of strictly, uh, or you might say more, academic philosophical institutions of the past, right? And I would argue that this is a new, this is another crisis, right? And universities are either going to come up with solutions or they're not, right? Someone with a new idea, a new model, is going to infiltrate the system and redirect it to a new ideal or not, in which case maybe this will be the final crisis of academia. Maybe academia will cease to be the kind of anchoring institution of Western society that it used to be. We don't know. It's, it's hard to know where a paradigm shift is going when you're in the middle of it. So thank you so much for listening, and uh, I'm interested in your reactions and your comments. You know, please comment on SoundCloud, Patreon, uh, or email me at historiansplaining at gmail.com. And if you want to hear all of my podcasts and lectures, please go to my Patreon page, also under Historiansplaining. Thank you.